Thank you. So I want to introduce everybody to Zan Fredericks. Um, Zan works for USGS and um, has agreed uh, very kindly to talk to our class today about LIDAR and more specifically bathymetric LIDAR. Um, if you have questions, like I said, put them into the chat and otherwise I'm going to turn it over to you, Zan, and whenever you want to share your screen, that's fine. I'm going to take myself off of the screen for and mute myself as well. Okay, great. Before I stop sharing my video, I did want to introduce myself. Uh, I feel like while face-to-face -face is always the best thing, still seeing someone's face when you can kind of get their emotions and their energy while they're talking. So my name is Ann Fredericks. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey. I serve the National Geospatial Program as an Associate National Map Liaison, and I also am the LIDAR Coordinator for the Coastal Marine Hazards and Resources Program. I'm based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Right now we've got beautiful weather. It sounds like going up north that you've got some bands of heavy weather going through. So especially in these times of uncertainty, be safe. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing the video and start sharing my screen. All right, so I wanted to talk to you guys today about the USGS because we have this mission to serve the nation. And my mission as an associate liaison and as the LIDAR coordinator is to specifically serve in the geospatial realm. So I want you to get to know the USGS a little bit better by sharing some of our initiatives. We're the nation's largest water, earth, and biological science and civilian topographic mapping agency. Now, Topographic mapping was undertaken at the USGS more than 125 years ago for the purpose of providing a base for scientists to map the nation's geology. Over the decades, the topographic products and services offered and the means by which they were developed have changed so many times based on changing expectations by users, societal and mission needs, new technologies, and other factors. Through seven mission areas, the USGS provides impartial and unbiased information on the natural hazards that threaten the nation, the health of our ecosystems and environment, even the natural resources the country relies on, and the impacts of land use change. Now, these mission areas were determined to address the large multidisciplinary challenges that we as a society face today. Now the core science system mission area provides a foundation for all USGS mission areas. We do that by conducting basic and applied science research and development and fostering a broad understanding and application of analyses and information. We also provide technical expertise and standards and methods. We build partnerships, we facilitate innovation, and, and especially important to this group, we create new geospatially enabled data and information, and then we gather it all we assemble it and we provide a framework for data information and sharing. So one of the programs within the core science systems mission area is the National Geospatial Program. And it provides a foundation of digital geospatial data representing the topography, the natural landscape and the man-made environment of the United States. Now, NGP geospatial products and services can be incorporated to aid in decision making and operational activities. These derived products and services are developed by working with partners and organizations who act, their activities align with those of NGP, and we work to increase the efficiency of the nation's geospatial community by improving communications not only about geospatial products, data, and services, but also about projects and needs and standards and best practices. So the USGS has this long history of providing elevation data. First, it was through contours on topographic maps and later by digital data in the National Elevation Data Set. And now it's through the 3D Elevation Program. The National Enhanced Elevation Assessment, I, I call it the NEA, was a needs and benefits study of federal, state, local, tribal, private entities, and it focused on high resolution elevation data. It was conducted back in 2012, and it allowed us to rank the top business uses of LIDAR by the total benefits identified by participants. And it was really this assessment that served as the impetus for the 3D elevation program. 
Some of the business uses include flood risk management that had the highest national dollar value and reported societal benefit and FEMA has been a big partner and supporter of the 3D elevation program. LIDAR is useful in infrastructure management, which with our aging infrastructure is a growing national concern. Geologic hazards is a critical application area for LIDAR. It can be used to map landslides and reveal previously unmapped faults. It also helps detect air navigation obstacles for aviation safety. Other applications include precision forestry, archaeology, wildfire management, planning, response, as well as alternative energy. You can use it to determine solar potential. Again, these are just a few of the important uses of 3 dap LIDAR and why this effort in collaboration is so critical to the nation at large. So if you're unfamiliar with the technology, LIDAR is like radar or sonar, but instead of using radio waves or sound waves, LIDAR uses light. Airborne LIDAR data are collected from aircrafts by using sensors that detect the reflections of a pulsed laser beam. So the reflections are recorded as millions of individual points and they're collectively called a point cloud. And it represents the 3D positions of objects on the surface of the Earth. Objects can be buildings, vegetation, infrastructure, the ground. LIDAR transforming mapping by providing both highly accurate maps of the Earth's surface and also three-dimensional data of all those natural and man-made features on that surface. The 3D Elevation Program is our newest effort to provide national elevation data and it, this plan was vetted across the community and published in the 2014 3DEP Call for Action and the goal is to acquire national LIDAR coverage by 2023 with IFSAR data in Alaska. Now, IFSAR is a type of radar that has lower accuracy um, and it's less detailed than LIDAR, but it's the preferred method for data collection in Alaska because it can penetrate cloud cover and operate from planes flying higher and faster, which is good for large collections in remote and challenging environments. We, we believe 3 depths transformational because it applies this groundbreaking LIDAR data to provide not only a higher resolution bare earth elevation surface, but also a three-dimensional data of all of the natural and constructive features. Because the program also calls for increasing the quality level. That's the sample density and the accuracy of the LIDAR data being acquired because it can meet so many more mission critical applications. So as the program matures and additional data become available, program participants are really finding and discovering new and innovative ways to use these data. The applications highlighted here represent data uses within the USGS where each of the USGS mission areas have explored and discovered uses of LIDAR data to support their missions. But the USGS isn't alone in our widespread use of the data. Each of the agencies contributing funding to the program have similarly discovered the value of data, and they've got this extreme return on investment for the dollars they commit to the program. So 3 up is a collective effort to develop partnerships to fund the program and accelerate that rate of acquisition to enable these benefits on a national level. But maybe there's already elevation data that could meet your needs. How can you find it? The USGS maintains the US Interagency Elevation Inventory, the USIEI, in partnership with NOAA to keep track of publicly available elevation data. The USIEI is updated annually, so it's really a critical tool for planning. But say you check the USIEI and you don't see any data, and now you're wondering if your area of interest overlaps with any upcoming areas of interest. In this case, 3 dev also uses the NOAA-sponsored C-Sketch site to gather and share requirements. Now, don't be misled by the name C-Sketch. While NOAA started this tool focusing on the nation's coast and offshore, it's grown to include inland areas too. So it now represents the entire nation. The 3 dev working group ensures that all federal requirements are documented in C-Sketch, and it encourages everyone else in the community to use the Public Areas of Interest Project Collector Tool to document where they'd like to see data be collected. So just earlier today, I visited the USIEI and I zoomed to Virginia, and then I dropped a marker close to your campus, and immediately nine topographic data sets listed as being in this area with their associated dates. 
And if I'd click that drop down next to the data set name, I'd be able to see the details of that data set from where I can access the data to the collection date, also the quality level, and if it meets 3 dep standards or not and why. It also lists the project status. That's important. It could still be in progress. The vertical and horizontal datums are provided. The accuracies are provided, the point spacing. It really provides enough light metadata to quickly assess if this data would be useful to you. But what if it's not? Maybe it's not suitable for your needs and you're curious to know if any new data is planned for your area. That's when you can really leverage CSketch. It's a collaboration site for mapping data acquisition and it's a great tool for finding points of contact. So here I'm only showing mapping projects that are planned and funded or ongoing. What I'm not showing are all of the proposed mapping areas. The, these areas may, be, may need more funding to come to fruition, and if the area overlaps with yours or is adjacent, you may be able to collaborate. If you're interested in data for your schoolwork, you could establish a relationship with point of contact so you can be kept in the loop as data become available. So click on a polygon, see who entered it, reach out to them. It could be a good way to start building your network. You can also use CSketch to determine if elevation data already exists over your area of interest. If you enabled the options at the very bottom, you can see some of the existing data inventories because they pull directly from the USIEI. So if you or someone you know or work with wants to get involved in 3 dep acquisition, there are really three steps. First, check to see if data already exists. Use the USIEI or CSketch. Second, coordinate and form partnerships. Federal agencies can contact the 3 dep working group member if you work for a state or local agency, or you want to enter it yourself, you can use CSketch to identify potential partners and reach out to your state's national map liaison. Third, you can submit a proposal to apply for 3 dep funding for the project. So this map that I'm showing shows the geographic extent of existing and in-progress 3 dep data acquisition projects as of October. And we now have high resolution elevation data available or in progress for more than 67% of the nation. Hey Sam, this is Shannon. Um, a quick question, in that map, are there reasons why certain states don't have as much as other states? There sure are. If you notice, predominantly they're out west, and those are predominantly federally owned areas. So it's interesting when we go to map lands, we look for these partnerships. So if we don't have state and local governments interested in getting it mapped to help us cost share, it doesn't get it mapped as quickly. We still aim to get it collected by 2023 to have the whole nation completed, but it's really challenging when, if it's just federally owned, we can only use those congressional funds so far each year. We'd really rather partner with the states and local agencies to help them get their data sooner rather than meet our federal needs first. And one more question. Um, I know states like Iowa, they have flown LIDAR, but they don't meet the standards necessarily for 3 dep. Um, is, is that part of the reason that also some data sets aren't in there? Because you're looking for this level of quality that they- Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So for 3 dep specifications, it has to be a quality level two. So you've got two points per square meter with a 10 centimeter vertical RMSE, and it has to be that QL2, that 10 centimeter RMSE or better to be included in 3 dep Because we want people to know when they come to this, you know, repository, what kind of data they're getting. Other data may be publicly available, absolutely. We've got some topobody LIDAR I'll talk about a little bit later that doesn't meet the point density to, in order to be included in 3 dep but we really want to show from a national level how we're trying to approach this to make it more of a systematic and viable resource at a certain quality level instead of that potpourri mix that you sometimes go out and find. Any other questions at this moment? No. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for asking them. Yeah, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. So up to this point, I've been focusing on how we gather data and how we coordinate the acquisition, but once we gathered the data, we do want to share it. All of the 3DEP products and services are available through the national map. 
These include digital elevation models at various horizontal resolutions, elevation source and associated data sets, and even elevation point query service, bulk point query service. All 3DEP products are available free of charge and without use restrictions. So when you visit the 3DEP homepage and click on that access data, the lower left green button, you're taken to the national map homepage. This is where you can navigate to our topo maps, both the current geo PDFs and the historical topo maps. Now what's cool about the current topo maps is that they're offered in both the geo TIFF and geo PDF format. So bear with me, I'm gonna try and show this. So I zoomed to William and Mary when I got to the topo map interface and I downloaded the current US topo map as a geo PDF. So I was able to zoom to the area and when I saw products, I saw that one was available and I just came to this download and I chose GeoPDF in this file format option down here. I could have done a GeoTIFF, but let me show you why a GeoPDF is where it's at. It's about 100 megs when I downloaded it, so be patient, give it a minute to download, but once it does, you can adjust what layers are included in this map. So say you want to print it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and those contours are gonna completely obscure anything else on the map. You can come in here and turn off the contours. I just think this is brilliant. Okay, or so you have the contours on, but you're saying, hmm, I'm not really sure I like that base map. What if I could include some ortho imagery instead? It gives you the options to go through and turn on what layer is important to you. And I just think that's a fabulous offering of the current US Topo Maps. Now, the old US Topo Maps are still available. The print versions are absolutely out there and can be shipped to you, or they could be printed, no problem. But at least this gives us more of a visualization tool to immediately turn it on and turn off layers. So you can also download GIS data from GIS staged products, such as standard DEMS. If you want a seamless nation, we've got two arc second or one arc second or one third arc second, or if you're interested in project-based, which will be seamless within projects, we offer legacy one ninth arc second. We've got one meter, we've got five meter, remember it's IFSAR data in Alaska. And we also provide the source data. So the LiDAR point clouds, the source stems with the original product resolution, digital surface models, orthorectified radar intensity imagery, we offer GIS download applications, even direct access via FTP in the Amazon's cloud. So users now have the option to work with massive LiDAR point cloud data sets without having to download them to their local machines. And the data are part of the open data registry provided by Amazon Web Services, similar to the Landsat archive. And then finally, on this page, we also offer applications and visualization services. So if you click on the apps and services, the lower right green button, you can access links to training videos on how to use the national map products, as well as help pages that encourage you to integrate any and all of the map services offered through the national map. That way you can use them within your own mapping applications. And from this page, we can also access different viewers and services, the APIs, the product lists, the elevation point query services, even raster conversion tools. When you click on the viewer option, the lower left green button, this is when you can access the 3 dep demonstration elevation viewer. Let me show you that one, because I think that one's pretty cool too. So it'll bring you to the site and Let's zoom back to Williamsburg, just so we have a little bit better understanding of where we're at. And using the icons at the left, you can change what view you're seeing of that area. So now I'm looking at multi-directional hillshade. I would expect it to be a little bit grayer, so it might, again, be the bandwidth. We've got an elevation tinted of hillshade. Again, just click through these and get a feel for what kind of visualizations are being offered. Um, you can also access the LiDAR Explorer 
And this is Hobie Wink and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers collaborated with the Amazon Web Services Public Datasets team to organize LiDAR point cloud data as entwined point tile resources so you can visualize them. Here I've got the three depth data for Puerto Rico that was collected pre Hurricane Maria. And I'm showing you this specifically because I just worked on these data for my master's. And to get the entire island, I had to download almost 4,500 blast tiles. That's over 300 gigabytes. So if I want to visualize the data on the fly, which would give me the ability to take a quick look and identify a specific area of interest for download instead of trying to work with the entire data set, I could click on the eye icon over here on the right. And I'm given two viewers from which to choose, a Poetry and a Plasio. Now I went ahead and opened these just so we wouldn't lose time. And here's the Poetry viewer. Now I went through, look at all the options you can adjust on the left, your background, your splat quality, your minimal nodes. You can even work with some tools. You've got navigation options. And what was really useful for me is right now, I'm a color ramp person and I am a classification person. So you could change your color ramp into something else that appeals to you or something that you're accustomed to so the data makes sense to you. And then you can change which classifications I'm looking at. This one I've got limited ground because at that time that's what I was working on. And I can change how many returns are included or sort by the GPS time. For Plasio, I went ahead and exaggerated the Z value, which is the elevation, because I wanted to be able to visualize outliers really quickly. So again, those are just some of the visualization tools offered by the National Geospatial Program. And also from this page, even mobile information is available, such as a download client or instructional videos, a national map webinar, and step-by-step -step instructions to really help you out. So I mentioned the National Map Services, and if you'd clicked on the Services button, instead of the viewers, you'd access this page. Did you know that we offer over 40 web map services for you to use in your applications? From this page, you, you can also check on the uptime status of each service, and even subscribe to receive notifications about upcoming service changes. I'm the user of these services. I'm part of our geospatial information response team and we create event support maps to be used internally by the department and our bureaus. And we've even made a few for public consumptions. And these maps support timely response and mitigation of natural hazards, which we're all currently feeling the impacts of. And on top of that, hurricane season is fast approaching. So the USGS has hazards teams waiting in the wings to ensure the USGS can respond as quickly and safely as possible to the needs of the Bureau during an event. And these internal event support maps can be disseminated to those various teams and they can provide a one-stop shop for most of the data and information provided on those daily calls when an event is happening. You can go through the tabs instead of working by an agenda. We use some of those 40 services I just mentioned in these event support maps from imagery to hazards models. We take advantage of many service endpoints. Uh, sometimes partners ask for publicly accessible event support maps. We've created event support maps in response to Hurricanes Michael and Florence in years past, and our most recent was in response to Dorian. The USGS has daily storm calls during a hurricane to share a weather forecasts, check in with impacted offices, hear about the latest models. From a total water level forecast to a coastal change hazards forecast that's run as soon as those storm surge models are released from the National Hurricane Center. And once those are run, the forecasts are displayed in viewers, such as the coastal change hazards portal. And that's what's showing up on the left for you, or on the right. And What's neat is it shows the probabilities of storm-induced collision and overwash and, well, or worse, inundation. And the portal also shows the elevations of the dune crest and the dune toe, the mean water levels in forecast area, the extreme water levels. It provides access to the National Weather Service. Um, their NHC forecast that was actually used in the modeling so people can follow the breadcrumbs backwards. It also has extreme storm data, uh, shoreline change data from short 
in long-term shoreline change rates to historical shoreline positions, sea level rise information is included, from coastal response likelihoods to a coastal vulnerability index and even shoreline change forecasts. Hurricanes, though, aren't the only hazards that cause a partner to ask for publicly accessible event support maps. Getting flood imagery out to the public can be vitally important. Recently, the Mississippi River City and Towns Initiative reached out to the USGS in response to the Midwest floods last year, and they wondered if we had satellite imagery that could help the mayors and their constituents, because they partner with our mid-continent region, who then asked the geospatial information and response team if we could create an event support map. We did, and we just unveiled it in August, and the mayors along the Mississippi River were so grateful to have a tool that showed information from response imagery that you could swipe left or right to see the flooding extent, to seeing the real-time stream gauge network data, to viewing the U.S. drought monitor, because drought is another hazard that the Mississippi River Basin faces, even though they weren't experiencing it then. So 3DEP is usually largely focused on terrain data, but what about the rivers or the lakes or even our intercoastal waterways? I'm the Associate Liaison to Florida. So Florida has the longest coastline in the contiguous United States. I'm not going to try and compete with Alaska. And for natural resource managers and flood modeling and so much more, we need data that extends beyond the land. We want this 3D nation. We want to map from the tops of the mountains to the depths of the seas and everything in between, including our inland rivers, lakes, and streams. The 3D Nation Elevation Requirements and Benefits Study will improve our understanding and data about the requirements and benefits at the state level for the existing and future program and help us understand how those dovetail in the near shore coastal zone. 2023 is not long off. It's, it's really important to be able to assess new technologies to support user requirements and identify any trade-offs between different approaches. So, the study really is a technology neutral or sensor agnostic approach that lets us focus on the need for and the value of 3D elevation data. But it will also improve our understanding of the needs to guide development of the next generation of 3D products and services, which will include Topavati LiDAR. So I wanted to provide a quick background about the differences. So it really starts with wavelength. It's the most distinguishing characteristic between topographic bathymetric and topobathymetric LIDARs. Now, topographic LIDARs usually have a wavelength between 905 and 1550 nanometers with 1064 being popular in the United States. Um, I think 1550 is what's popular in Europe. And those wavelengths lose most of their power through absorption in the water column after only, gosh, a few centimeters of depth. So if we double the frequency of the popular 1064 nanometer wavelength, we get a 532 nanometer blue-green wavelength. You'll often hear it referred to as a green laser because of the closeness of the wavelength to pure green or 550. And this is because in the coastal zone, the presence of chlorophyll actually absorbs most or more of the blue light. So the blue-green laser, with an emphasis on green, has a better chance for penetration. Now, a bathymetric LIDAR usually uses this 532 nanometer wavelength, ensuring water penetration, but you'll also hear the term topobathymetric LIDAR, and those either use the same 532 nanometer wavelength because it can also map topography, or some will actually use combination of both a longer and a shorter wavelength laser. And while a 532 nanometer wavelength can penetrate water, the signal strength attenuates exponentially through the water column, and that's something really important to keep in mind. So the need of a different wavelength from topographic LIDAR is due to light propagation characteristics when changing mediums. In this case, we're changing from air to water. So light reflects off the surface of the water, it refracts at the air-water interface, it's scattered, and while here I've got it scattering at the surface for simplicity, we also know that it scatters within the water column, which redistributes the energy. It's absorbed, which reduces the energy of the signal. So the light is bent, it's slowed down. We've got to account for that exponential signal attenuation. 
So how does bathymetric LIDAR work? Well, a laser pulse is sent from the sensor and receivers record the energy from the surface reflection, the bottom reflection, and also any backscattered energy that's returned. It sounds simple enough. We depend on the laser pulse propagating through the water column to reach the bottom. And this is a great introduction to the theory of bathymetric LIDAR, but this is more how bathymetric LIDAR really works. It's extremely dependent on temporally and spatially varying conditions. You've got bottom reflectance and water clarity. To me, those are probably the two largest factors, but water depth, sun angle, surface conditions, all of that impacts how much bending there is. We know that the, in what angle the laser hits a flat water surface, but what if it's not flat? Rarely is it flat. What if it's too flat and it just completely reflects? And not only that, where is the water surface? With a green laser, that's tricky to determine. You will hear since systems using this longer wavelength pulse to determine where that water surface actually is. So if the LiDAR system has a narrow receiver field of view, they're extremely sensitive to small changes in turbidity and energy scattered by suspended sentiment. So when planning a LiDAR survey that will have a bathy component, you've got to ask if the water is clear, is it muddy? What are the characteristics of the seafloor? What color is it? Is it bright sand or is it dark mud? Is there vegetation? Uh, what's the overall morphology? Are there breaking waves or lots of bubbles? Hopefully you've got someone that you can ask that might be familiar with the environment. And knowing the environment and the specific project requirements will help determine if a bathymetric or a topobathymetric LIDAR is more appropriate. So bathymetric LIDARs usually have longer and higher power pulses, but they require clear water for that power to be useful. Topobathymetric LIDARs usually have shorter, lower power pulse, which can be useful in shallow, more turbid environments. So if you know what range of depths you want to survey, or what point spacing is required, or what size feature are you trying to map? It will help determine which sensor is right for the proposed survey. And you'll hear these terms interchanged as some people simply mean mapping topography and submerged topography when talking about topobathymetric. But if someone starts listing the reasons for preferring a bathymetric lighter over a topobathymetric lighter, that's usually when you know they're talking from a technology standpoint. Uh, another desire of pretty much any data user is to have easier access to existing data. And I think we've covered the USIEI and the National Map Viewer. So I want to also mention NOAA's Digital Coast Access Viewer. This is a great site to bookmark if you're interested in BATI data. If I know a BATI LiDAR mission was flown and processed, I can usually find it in one of these places. Oftentimes though, I might be in a hurry to locate a link to a BATI data set. And if that is the case, I have these two links bookmarked on every single browser I have. I start with either the LiDAR point cloud data set list or the imagery and elevation raster data set list. Both are hosted by NOAA's Digital Coast. And what's great is that this tabular format allows me to use a control F to search quickly to locate a data set. There are even separate lists for the point clouds versus the digital elevation models or imagery. So if you need both, don't forget to look in both places. But if you only need one, you only need to look in one place. And also, if you do, one little caveat, if you do a control F search, it's good to remember that sometimes states are abbreviated and sometimes they're not. So recently I was looking for Bathy data in Florida and I had to make sure I searched for both FL and Florida to try to miss a data set. But to me, that's a small thing to remember, to be able to provide a scientist or an inquiring mind with a link to index shape files that they can quickly open and overlap with their area to see if that data set covers their area of interest. But in addition to easier access to the data, users often desire broader coverage by the LIDAR data. Understanding that body LiDAR is more time consuming to collect, you might have to wait on water conditions to improve or the right tide window and that the plane usually flies slower and lower to leverage power and increase point density. It's also more time consuming to process because processing is a much more complex uh, process, if you will, than topographic LiDAR. 
This graphic shows Earl B. Bathymetric LIDAR data collected around St. Thomas, USVI, and while the collection only took nine days to fly, the processing took a team of three people many, many, many months to complete. Because of the varying water depths, we had different bottom types, the water column was different, the surface conditions were different. This data set ended up needing more than five customized parameter sets in the use of different algorithms for processing. And since the environment included coral heads, editing was more time consuming to ensure that the automated filters didn't actually remove good data. And the quality of products you can expect from Tibbetti LiDAR almost rival those of Tibbetti LiDAR. Uh, they're less accurate, usually closer to 25 to 30 centimeters of vertical uncertainty rather than 10 centimeters of absolute vertical accuracy we see with Topo LiDAR. And they do cost more. Again, they take longer to collect, so you've got more time in the field, more playing time, more processing hours. So why spend this extra time and cost to map our coastal waters? Don't we have nautical charts, right? Those questions are probably running around in your heads. And your campus has rivers to the north, to the south. You're not terribly far from the beach. I live in St. Petersburg, Florida on a peninsula. So we know the coast is highly vulnerable. We've seen the rapid change due to storms. Physical characterization is necessary for effective coastal management and some of our near shore and offshore areas haven't been mapped since the 50s or e even longer. Back then, they used lead line sounding. Some areas were mapped with only one sounding for, per 100 square meters. And to really show you what this means, I was curious. So as a teenager, one of my first jobs was working at a dive shop in Big Pine Key, Florida. I spent the summer taking tourists out on dive boats and we visited Luke Key Reef. It's this absolutely gorgeous textbook spur and groove reef. It's, it's just magnificent. And so I went to data and I, decided to look at it. And this is what the reef looks like if we only have one data point for every 100 square meters. Now reds are shallower areas, greens and blues are deeper. So you can see there's something there, but not really enough details to see the true form. The Florida Keys have been mapped recently with modern technologies that can deliver high resolution elevation data of the seafloor. And the difference to me is astounding. No NGS collected this data back in 2016 and even newer data were flown last winter. So if you were in charge of managing this part of the sanctuary, what data set would you wanna use? Now we can see the sperm group formation of this reef. So even divers and boaters may find this valuable. Modern high resolution bathymetry can significantly improve our understanding as we interact with the ocean we're surrounded by and it can provide this measurable economic benefit. So having an up to date characterization of coastal systems helps managers develop effective strategies to protect human health and infrastructure. While new high resolution seafloor data could really help us grow our blue economy and facilitate sustainable aquaculture and alternative energy. Now what's cool is that programs like the Florida Coastal Mapping Program leverage GIS to learn more about where we should focus mapping efforts. We, we want it all mapped eventually, but our budgets don't, you know, we support all at once kind of initiative and the technology isn't quite there yet. So NOAA's National Ocean Service developed a prioritization participatory GIS tool using Web App Builder for ArcGIS to collect the where, the what, and the why. It's grid-based, it's got pre-populated pull-down menus for easy attribution, and the responses are saved as they're made with automated QAQC enforcement. Now for Florida, NOAA worked with us to help us realize how we could customize this widget for the program. So with their help, we created a statewide prioritization tool for high-resolution baseline elevation data that's stakeholder-driven, prioritizes the what and the why, and separates the prioritizations for each region. So the image on the right is showing you the priority index with regional divisions. And what's great about this is that by collecting the information in a GIS tool, we, we went around the state, we had these uh, regional workshops and all the stakeholders came, we taught them how to use the tool, then they went back to their local and state agency offices and they invited their peers and colleagues to come in and fill out this tool. So you're looking at this great amalgam and it lets us now provide those prioritization analytics 
that we can share back to the stakeholders along with the GIS layer so people can go in and navigate to a particular cell and see which agency wanted high resolution elevation data there and why. High resolution elevation data can support so many initiatives and so much science and these data and derivative products and visualizations are gathered and shared through a variety of geospatial tools. I try to provide a broad overview of some of the tools and viewers and portals, but keep in mind that the National Geospatial Program is just one program within one USGS mission area. Think of how many more products and services are out there. These are just a sampling of how the USGS serves the nation geospatially, and I encourage you to go check out the rest. So in closing, I'll leave you with this. I understand that sometimes visualizing data or looking for data sets takes a leap of faith. Where's this viewer taking you? Where, what are you going to find? What condition will the data be in? Will there be sufficient metadata? Who put the data there? Is it authoritative? Who collected it? How is it collected? Can you easily access it? Will it meet your needs? That part's important and you need to remember the why, especially as students remember visualizations take time. They are not assembled selfishly. We create them to help get our data to the people who need it. And we hope by doing so that no matter the experience level, people can accomplish their goals more efficiently and be more productive because Let's face it, you can spend copious amounts of time and effort visualizing data, but remember that the best visualizations are those that convey your data truthfully and with impact. So thank you so much for letting me share a little bit of my work. So Zan, I really appreciate the fact that you've joined us today. And I know one of the things that I just put in the chat for everyone is that live demos of LIDAR data um, over Zoom with bandwidth issues um, really don't work well because it, it does take quite a bit of processing, um, especially if you're looking at something like Zion National Park, this image that we we're looking at. But these sure. web resources are amazing um, geo visualizations of that LIDAR data. Um, I was really impressed with the lack of lag that was taking when you were showing um, some of these. And I know they probably took a little bit to load. Um, and I, let's, you know what, let's for, let's refresh and just give everyone a kind of, if this is hitting the ground running, what would, how long would this take? So this is how Puerto Rico will come in. And I, having used this viewer before, I know to expand my options on the left. And I know to go down to the bottom to be like, what am I looking at? Like, why am I only seeing this? And it's because I'm looking at the attribute of intensity, which is great. Most people like to, you know, consider that, but I, I'm an elevation viewer kind of person. So again, I'm just going through here and hopefully there isn't too terrible of a lag, but you see that it's, I'm impressed now. What I will say why this is working as well as it is, if I scroll back up to the top, is they've given you this great option. I have my point budget at the maximum. So this actually should have been slower than I was expecting. You can reduce your points that you're visualizing, which if you are truly just looking for an area of interest, I recommend you always subsample your points until you find your area and then work with the full density of the data set. Because by and large in any software you use, unless you've got great GPU, a good graphics card, and lots of RAM to write those temporary files to, you are gonna crash your system time and time again. Hey, Zan. Yes. Introduce with, yourself. Uh, it, this is Matt. <laughs> um, with, the, uh, with the classification tools that are in this viewer, you, you could use it to also get a good idea of how to visualize a, uh, a, a DSM and not just a bare earth DEM, correct? I don't see why not. Let's see if we could go in. So this is the whole point cloud. So if I turned off everything but vegetation or something like that, and additionally, let me back up one step because I asked to be viewing the point cloud. So what if you did just want to view the DEM in our 3 depth LiDAR Explorer, you can very specifically ask for that information as well. So if you, for some reason, don't want to even bother with 
you know, your first surface that you were interested in a digital surface model instead of a digital elevation model. Perhaps you just want a quick raster to view what the ground looks like. I would definitely avoid looking at the point cloud because again, that the pool of resources is really going to cause your system to be sluggish. Jump over to this dem and do the same kind of step. But yes, you are right. Back to the point cloud and this poetry in theory. Again, I haven't played with this this much. You see how frequently, but if I'm turning off other classes other than vegetation, I start to get a feeling for interesting, maybe classification of low, medium, and high wasn't too prevalent, or is it because I've got my points at such a low density up top? So let's try that as well. I like visualization viewers um, for the simple fact that I can start to get a feel for kind of what my data sets are doing. Now, I happen to know El Yunka National Forest is in the Southeast region, and I'm not navigating very well here, forgive me. Um, so I'm kind of surprised by this. I would think it's much more dense and prevalent. Again, because this is pre-Hurricane Maria data, the post, they did see some deforestation. That data should be hitting the national map in May. So if you wanna do a pre and post-Hurricane assessment, you could come in here and you know, check it out. Now I will say when the data hits the national map versus when the data hits the Amazon Web Services to be available in the Ladder Explorer, there may be some lag there because of course they just want to get the actual data available to people via the national map before they get it, you know, put in requests or pays buckets or something like that on Amazon Web Services. So you might be have to be a little bit patient for the post data to hit the viewer or any kind of data if you see it pop up on the national map. And you're like, but I don't see it available. It's not showing up in the LiDAR Explorer as able to be viewed as an entwined point tile service. Just, just be patient or you know what? You have my email address. Um, if not, I'll share it. I'll chat it to the group right now. Please just email me. I'd be happy to absolutely talk to anybody or point you to your state's national map liaison. Um, I think that's really important. So do reach out, but yeah, great question, Matt. It, this would be a tool or any kind of visualization viewer would allow you to adjust the points you're looking at to see, oh, what does the surface look like versus what does the DEM look like? Thank you. Certainly. Does anybody else have any questions? I know for most folks, this is kind of the introduction that they've had to LIDAR. Um, so I think that's a, it's been a really great overview. Um, and like I said, I was impressed with the drawing and the ability, uh, the flexibility and all of the things that I saw that you could bring in, you could turn off, you could turn on, had the sliders that were in it. Um, it's, it's quite amazing for, on the geo visualization side. I, I think they've done a really good job. And I do, I will fully disclose that I did screen grabs fearing terribly that the bandwidth would not let any of these tabs load. That's why I had tabs open instead of just clicking and letting you guys see the process live. Um, I've done, I've had death by demo before in a presentation. So I thought I'd back myself up with those screen grabs. I did not mean to be death by PowerPoint by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm glad they did come through because I know sometimes even my screen refreshes much more quickly than it comes across on yours. So that's great to hear. I just, I'll definitely, um, those sites are available. I think I included the national map or the National Geospatial Program homepage in the links I'd sent you earlier. So again, you should be able to use that as a springboard to all of these resources, but you guys have my email now. So if you, if you lose a link or you can't find it or you are interested in bookmarking, um, I can also share these slides and I hyperlinked a lot of the details and the resources available. That would be great. I, I appreciate that offer and I can pair that um, with the recording for others who, who are, um, weren't able to make this or who are watching this after the fact. Um, do you find that there is um, a growing need for LIDAR in ways that we haven't imagined previously? I've been shocked because I was, I did coastal geology in my undergrad, so I've been very geologically focused, geomorphology focused. I've been shocked at the applications I would have never thought of. When they say the applications for LIDAR are limitless, I'm, I'm starting to believe them. Um, from the solar potential, which I thought was amazing, just looking at the aspect, um, of how buildings are facing all the way to infrastructure management or 
uh, wireless communication towers are now using view shed analysis to be able to see when there might be obstructions to radio waves and things like that. And uh, the infrastructure part, because there's this push for higher density, higher accuracy LIDAR data, which our technologies, I don't think is prepared for yet, not just our technology collecting it, I mean more on the user end. <laughs> Again, I, I was working with this Puerto Rico data and I can tell you, I, I'd like to think I have a pretty robust system. I mean, I don't have like Alienware gaming system or anything like that, but I thought I had enough RAM and GPU to, and a good graphics card and I struggle and I know what I'm doing. So I feel for anybody that is looking at these super dense, super high resolution data sets and not really knowing how to leverage them. So that's why I think these visualization, these viewers that will let you kind of work with the data without pulling it down to your system locally are so important. But I just, from landslide analysis, they were able to go in and you know do a quick before and after. And while they weren't able to say specifically at you know, sub-decimeter level because our LiDAR data weren't that accurate, um, what the volumetric change was, they were able to go in and immediately show areas of change. So then they could go into the field with a little bit more, you know, awareness of what they may be facing. But it definitely the infrastructure to me, because that's so opposite of the realm I'm accustomed to working in, those advances and how people have used those, those applications just amazed me. And I'm constantly, people come in with new ideas saying like, oh, I'm going to use it to adjust, you know, the center lines of roads, which I, of course I should think of it that way, but I, I've never used it. So I was short-sighted. Yeah. It's interesting to me starting off, I'm not going to talk about how many years ago when we were really struggling to work with, you know, basic satellite imagery and, you know, computers having to deal with that. And then um, when LIDAR came about, I can remember I was at NC State 20 years ago and had a student that really wanted to use coastal LIDAR data. And the computers in the lab that I was teaching GIS um, in actually couldn't handle it. Um, and I didn't know what to do to help the student at that moment. Um, and it's so interesting now that at least, you know, I, I agree that sometimes you need the Alienware gaming computer for the graphics card and, and some of those things. But it's amazing to me what we can visualize with computers today is so, so different. I 100% I agree with that, right? Because like back in the late 90s, when I was first working on this, like we were still using paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> this, this, this whole technology boom and the advancements, we didn't always just use paper, but it just, it's amazing. I had realized how far I'd come when I was trying to download those 4,500 files for Puerto Rico. What I thought was gonna take me a few weeks ended up taking me the better part of two months. But can you imagine what that would have been like back in the 90s? <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and I imagine for the students that are in my class now, what it's gonna be like 20 years from now and the, you know, the things that we collect, you know, I'm seeing a lot of 3D models coming from drones, um, kind of using FODAR, you know, it's not true LIDAR, sure. but. Yeah, structure from motion. Like we definitely, we've had people fly their drones and then use the imagery they collect to densify the LIDAR point cloud. How cool is that? Yeah, it's amazing to me. Um, those those technological advances. And, and so how how do you keep up with the advances and how do you, network to find out the things that are up and coming that you either may be interested in personally, but also professionally that you need? Uh, professionally, I feel that professional societies have been the biggest boon of my career. I was first involved with ASPRS, that's the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. And I joined them because LIDAR is remote sensing. And it was really, I just wanted to be able to read some journals. You know, they tell you when you're entering a, any kind of industry that that's, you know, start somewhere that you can read journals and keep up that way. We did not, being new to the industry at the time, I was not the person sent to go to conferences. I was, you know, low man on the totem pole, if you will. And I understood that, but I still wanted to learn more and keep up to date. Um, but I quickly found that just by trying to read periodicals wasn't sufficient enough for me. So then I joined another professional society, which was great because it gave me a different perspective and that's ERISA. So that's the Urban and Regional Information System Association. 
And what was great about ERISA is ASPRS gave me lots of good federal contacts and they still had state and local agencies, but not like ERISA. ERISA, I walked in and maybe it's because my first GIS Pro conference was in Jacksonville and I'm based in Florida, but immediately every single person I met said they were from a county or a local agency. And it was just interesting to me that I was like, hey, did you know that there's LIDAR for this area? And they were so grateful. They were so excited where when I was at ASPRS, oftentimes people, I was there with NOAA. So of course, NOAA's like, oh yeah, of course we host your data. And while ASPRS gave me a different background, ERISA gave me a completely new network. And then all of a sudden I started realizing what I could learn from them instead of just how I could help them with the data they didn't know they could access. Or it really, it helped me develop more professionally because then the more you feel like you can help people, the more you feel comfortable presenting to them because I will disclose I I'm not a natural public speaker, but when you get me on a topic I enjoy, I can't help but want to share the information I've learned because I think it's so cool. And they really fostered that in me from a, that's from a professional standpoint, from a practical standpoint, I literally on April 7th just presented for my master's in GIS from Penn State. It had been over a decade and Someone had come to me three years ago and said, hey, we heard you're the GIS expert in the office. Can you help us with this? And I went to open ARC and I realized it was like three versions old. I hadn't used it that long because I'd moved into more of a coordination role. And I just felt all thumbs with all the innovations that had happened. And I told myself, you know, go home and make sure you take a MOOC or something like that. You know, sign on to Udemy or find a way to discipline yourself and take a course. And that didn't happen. So I my husband and I were finally like, hey, it's time. Like, you've been wanting to do this. We said you were going to get a master's a long time ago. And I finally bit the bullet and went back to school. And two years later, I'm very, very glad. I, I started my postdoc certificate in GIS. That was back in 2010. And again, it's been 10 years. And now I'm going to graduate with a master's because at the time, I just wasn't ready for it. And I was gaining so much good experience through work that I really didn't need it back then. But then all of a sudden I was gaining all this professional experience at work, but I was losing the technology and the innovative, you know, I don't know, you can go to a conference and you see all these great presentations, but so many concurrent sessions and you can only talk to so many people. And if you serve the society, then you're in some committee meetings and it can be a little challenging. So you come away with a great experience, but you may not have learned what's the up and coming, what, what piece of software or technology can help you and your team. So between keeping education, even if it is a MOOC, like start there, keep yourself learning and having to learn and maybe you do better than I do with self-discipline and you can just set your schedule or consider going back for a certificate or something like that. So really between professional societies and constantly educating myself, that's, and finding people that like to talk about it. Not, I'm not saying you that all your happy hours have to be, you know, shared with geospatial professionals or anything like that. But if you're that passionate, you'll find the ones that you can tell feel the same way. And oftentimes I talk to people and I'm like, oh my goodness, I have no idea. And don't be afraid to learn. And don't be afraid to say, I don't know, because I don't know. Gracious. Somebody tried to call me a LIDAR expert the other day. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like I learned from the LIDAR expert, the man that taught me who actually flew our plane and built the LIDAR system. He's a LIDAR expert. But don't be afraid or think it's shameful or anything to say that with this development and technology that, gosh, please teach me something new. And if I am wrong, be gentle, but let me know. Like, you don't have to make a fool of me, but do let me know so I can learn. So that way I don't perpetuate it, right? Like we, it's oftentimes there is this big ethical movement in geospatial data and you've got to be cognizant of that. There's so much information in what we do and the data we are getting. So please don't forget about that and don't perpetuate that in the sense that if you hear a statistic or you hear of a data set, make sure it's authoritative. Make sure that you, you do a little check before you just bandy about another statistic that then may cause the situation to get worse. Because oftentimes I think people forget about the ethical obligation that we have as geospatial people. So that's my thought. Thank you so much. Um, I am so grateful for you to join us today. Um, I, I'm going to ask everybody to unmute and if they want to turn on their video, I know it may slow us down a little bit, but I think the thank yous are definitely, um, definitely in order. So, um, I, we do appreciate 
your visit to our virtually to our class during this time. And um, I'm sure that those who who are interested will will act will reach out via email. I want to remind everybody: don't forget to download the chat. Um, and so the recording. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop that now. But I put these links also in the description on YouTube.